Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, as Lizzie said, my name is Mary Jane McKitterick and I am the Community Planning Manager with Away Home Canada. Welcome to an Away Home webinar designed to increase knowledge and capacity on youth homelessness community planning. Today we are using this webinar to begin, begin an overdue conversation on youth homelessness in rural and remote communities. Thank you to our pres presenters and all of you for taking the time out of your day to join us. I'd also like to acknowledge that this series is in partnership with the COH or the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness. A special thank you to Naveen and Lindsay from the COH today for all your support in setting up and running of these webinars. Sorry, now I have to, oh, there, just getting used to that. Okay, Away Home Canada is a national coalition of partners that are dedicated to preventing and ending youth homelessness in Canada. And we bring together key players that touch on youth homelessness from across and within the nonprofit, private, and public sectors. You may recognize some or all the names of some of our partner organizations. You can find details about our coalition, our partners, and the recordings of previous webinars on our uh, website at awayhome.ca. Okay, so I'd like to uh, welcome our presenters today, um, and then I'll, I'll, do our, I'll go through our agenda in a bit. So the first presenter today is Joshua Smee. He is the Provincial Expansion Coordinator at Choices for Youth, a charity that serves homeless, homeless and at-risk youth in St. John's, Newfoundland, and Labrador. In that role, he works to build partnerships and capacity to serve at-risk youth in communities across the province. Heavily engaged as a community volunteer, Josh is involved in a wide range of organizations working on issues of food security, urbanism, community dialogue, and women's rights. Josh Shkmech, sorry, Kamech is the Pro Program Manager for Homelessness Partnering Strategy and the Alberta Rural Development Network, a not-for-profit organization whose membership is comprised of nine public Albertan universities and colleges, and which has recently focused its efforts on organizing homelessness and affordable housing in rural and remote areas of the province. John manages the rural and remote stream of HPS funding for Alberta. He works with various community organizations and nonprofits. Uh, as they implement their HPS projects and work toward ending rural and remote homelessness. He currently helps administer 12 active projects in rural Alberta, very busy, including several that focus on uh, rural, uh, rural youth homelessness. Terry Lee Kelford, she is now uh, actively engaged as the Chair of Cornerstone Landing Youth Services, a non-profit charitable organization focused on the prevention and reduction of youth homelessness in Lanark County, Ontario. As an advocate of rural specific programs and services for youth, Terry Lee has helped grow Cornerstone Landing from a small prevention based program to a multi service organization aimed at preventing, reducing, and ultimately ending youth homelessness across the county. She enjoys speaking from the unique features and challenges, oh, sorry, about the unique features and challenges of rural youth homelessness on the local and national level. So, just go through our agenda uh, today. <clears throat> I will begin by providing some information about our Away Home Canada and situate the rural and remote youth homelessness within the broader um, youth homelessness issue and identify what our role might be going forward as we engage in this issue. The first two presenters will provide us with a, an overview of initiatives that are occurring in other provinces. Our aim is to build on what is already happening uh, and share that with, uh, with you. Uh, Joshua will... Um, discuss the exciting systems change that is occurring across rural Newfoundland and Labrador. And John will share some of the work of the Alberta Rural Development Network, a network that combines the best of research and community to create, create impact across the province. Terry Lee and I will focus on the discussion on Ontario and some ideas for creating space nationally to engage rural and remote youth homelessness. Following that, we'll have some time for questions, and uh, we do encourage you, as, as Lindsay said, to add your questions as you think of them during the, the presentations, and then uh, we'll respond to them in the, at the end. Oops, sorry, what happened there? There we go. Okay, just a, a few acronyms I'm gonna flash up on the screen because we use them so often. Uh, particularly the last one is, is one that I kind of just, I'm just using, if I say rural and remote youth homelessness, uh, over and over in the slides, it takes up so much space. So R R Y H is, is what that is. So what do we do at Away Home Canada? We uh, um, Away Home we reimagine solutions to youth homelessness through transformations in policy, planning, and practice. Uh, while inspiring communities, states, and countries around the world to adopt the brand and to sign on to a global movement for change. We work with all orders of government, communities, service providers, and philanthropy to create a, pol a policy investment 
and service environment that enables a shift away from managing the problem through emergency services to a more pro proactive and rights-based approach. This focuses on prevention, which is stopping young people from becoming homeless in the first place, and then helping those who are homeless move um, into housing with supports as rapidly as possible in a safe plan and planned way. Our collective work is evidence-driven and solutions-focused. Just to give you a sense of some of the work that we do, we have this here, this is a sampling of, of some of our resources. Uh, sorry, the, the, there's policy tools that's supposed to be on the left and planning and practice on the right. Um, but these are key uh, examples of key resources that support all of our work. They can be found on our website. Um, you can see that we have policy uh, briefs, surveys, case tools, um, sorry, program case tools, and webinars, et cetera. So if you want any more information about the multiple resources that we have, please feel free to contact me or just peruse our website, uh, the resources section. So um, as, you can, as you will see in today's webinar, the efforts in Alberta and Newfoundland are impressive, and we want to build on them and help other provinces and territories adopt and scale them. However, right now in most parts of Canada, the issue and innovation for rural and remote youth homelessness are unique, but they're not really well known yet. They're not really supported or scaled across all provinces and territories as we'd like. Uh, this issue is not necessarily part of the national conversation yet either, and, and that's, that's something we want to change. But also there's an absence of relevant research and mechanisms to share best practices. So there's a need to shine the spotlight on the issues facing young people in rural and remote communities and the solutions for that as well. <clears throat> so what can a, a way home do? Uh, we support all communities towards systems change and the shift to prevention. But moving forward, we want to ensure that a rural lens is employed. That might include, for example, supporting the integration of rural issues with their nearby municipal homelessness plans. Uh, we work locally, uh, provincially, and, and pan-Canadian, but we support uh, coordinated responses locally but at the provincial level, um, it might be um, more to strengthen the work that is underway and identify the gaps in policy. But bringing um, rural and remote issues and solutions into the national movement is a, is a big piece of our work as well, and we're going to be move, moving forward with that as well because we're partnering with, our, uh, with other networks such as the ARDN, Choices, and many others. So it's through our partnerships that we want to strengthen this work. <clears throat> At Away Home, we also promote and value partnerships between the homelessness sector and research institutions. So an example of this is the, the work between the COH, or the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness, and Away Home Canada to co-create a research agenda. Um, some of the things that, that are seen here as examples of a research agenda are also seen in our, uh, the previous slides on, on resources. But point in time toolkits, for example, definitions of youth homelessness, a national survey, our policy briefs, uh, program model case studies uh, such as Housing First for Youth. Um, some of the work that is still come, yet to come will be on prevention and cost effectiveness. We also have um, a, a, another good example story of our data driven solution is the youth assessment and prioritization tool. So the YAP tool is an, an innovation in helping youth homelessness program or a system of care gain a greater understanding of where, um, sorry, my phone's going off. <laughs> gain a greater understanding of where youth is on their road to experiencing long-term homelessness. So this tool is really important because it assists in the prioritization of these, of youth for programs and services that are, that best fit them. Uh, the tool has two parts. It includes a pre-screen and a more strength-based interview. It's designed to inform uh, five na narrative domains focusing on life areas, such as housing needs, social networks, health and wellness, etc. So it's free. We have a lot of trainer certification, and I really invite you to contact us for more information on the app tool. Now, I'm very pleased, though, to introduce our speakers, Joshua Smee from Choices for Youth and John Schmeck from the Rural Alberta, sorry, Rural Alberta Rural Development Network, who will share some of the impressive systems change work that they are doing. This purpose, as I've mentioned, is to share some innovations in these provinces so that we can build on this work and catalyze it in other provinces and territories. Following them, Terry Lee and I will focus on Ontario and discuss how we can build on their work. Uh, we'll discuss the development of a network to support and scale rural and remote innovation in Ontario. 
But though we are focusing on Ontario in this discussion, the, what we're saying really pertains to every province and territory in Canada. So those who are listening, please consider how this might work for you and reach out to us to explore this further. So Josh, please take it away. Thank you so much. Hi everyone from uh, sunny St. John's. Uh, hmm. I think what I'll do today is, uh, this is gonna be a bit treetops because one of the things that's happening here in Newfoundland uh, and Labrador that we're most excited about is some really large scale systems change that we think is gonna make a, a pretty big difference in the lives of, of rural and remote youth. So I, I wanna give you all a picture of that and how it all stitches together. Uh, I, I spend a fair amount of my time uh, explaining that within my own province. So I, I will give you a quick intro to choices and a bit of context on what's happening. Uh, and I, I do want to tell you a little bit about the process that we've been going through to engage the community on this. Uh, I've spent much of the last 18 months reaching out to young people, to service providers, to government on these issues, uh, and give you a sense of what lessons learned and next steps we've uh, we've come up with. So just uh, a little bit of a picture of choices for folks who don't know who we're, we are. Um, we were founded in 1990 uh, after the Mount Cashel orphanage um, scandal, which some might be familiar with. It uh, largely kicked off uh, years of, uh, of sexual abuse scandals in the Catholic Church. Uh, but here there was a large orphanage that suddenly closed, rendering many youth homeless. Uh, we're now one of the larger nonprofits in the province, uh, around 130 staff, upwards of 1,200 young people each year, which in a, a province of half a million is, is quite a lot. Uh, we've got the four core areas of work that we're doing uh, up there, and I'm not going to get into the details of all of them because there's a lot of work happening, uh, but just to say that it's a pretty comprehensive youth service model and to say that we are working and doing our best to push more towards prevention and in intervention at the family level. There we go. Um, again, a little bit more context here, just so you know, our population is primarily ages 16 to 29. Uh, within that, uh, the vast majority would be 16 to 25 year olds. If you come to us and you're 26 or 27, we are largely trying to figure out what kind of supports you'll have when you enter into the, the quote unquote adult system. Um, those are some of the, the common challenges we'd see. I'm sure they're familiar for anyone uh, working in this field. Um, you know, there's, I would say uh, the vast majority of the youth who we'd work with have multiple overlapping challenges um, and certainly well over 70% of them would have been through the child intervention system, for example. Um, so uh, there are definitely some, some complex needs at work here. Uh, and I will just give you a quick sense of our programs. We do a lot of family reconnect work, uh, intervention with uh, young mothers. Uh, we have an increasing focus on uh, social enterprise and uh, CESP, sorry for the acronym, stands for Centralized Employment Support uh, Program. So providing wraparound supports for young people in employment. We operate shelter and outreach services and we operate a number of different housing options from supportive to scattered site. What I, I'm really here to talk to you about though is how we're fitting into the provincial uh, dialogue. And this is a new space for us. Uh, we are uh, a St. John's based organization. For anyone who's uh, familiar with um, Newfoundland and Labrador, you'd understand St. John's is in the extreme east of the province, uh, quite far away from, from many of the province's communities. It's the only uh, large city. Uh, we have about 200,000 people. The next biggest town in uh, our next biggest city in, in the province is about 25,000. Um, and up until now, we've only been active within the city, but we are already effectively serving the entire province. So we see a substantial proportion of young of our young people who come through our doors are from well outside of St. John's. Um, they could be from uh, anywhere on the island and in the Labrador portion of the province. So uh, we operate, for example, the only youth shelter in the entire province. So if you ended up homeless in, in Labrador City, uh, if nothing else could be found for you, you might be uh, put on a plane and flown down to St. John's to access one of those shelter beds. So, so we are by default almost uh, at, at provincial scope. But at the same time, um, we have a recognition that that's not working for many of these young people who are cutting themselves off from their support systems and their home environments. Um, so our commitment uh, at a program level is to be active ourselves at six sites around the province by 2020. We're also pretty active in the policy space um, because what we've been learning um, as we work towards our own expansion is also a really important part of the conversation as we advocate for there to be a written plan uh, for youth homelessness in our province. 
So I do want to give you a sense of where systems change here is coming from, uh, because I think it's a really unique time in, in Newfoundland right now, uh, and that's going to have some huge impacts on youth. So towards recovery, uh, this was a report from an all-party committee on mental health that uh, was adopted in its entirety by our current government and is essentially tearing apart and rebuilding our entire mental health and addiction system in, in what I would say is a very positive way. Uh, much more distribution of services to, uh, to smaller communities in particular, uh, and a focus on integrated service delivery for youth. Uh, and that's where we're fitting in quite a bit. At the same time, we had a premier's task force on educational outcomes that recommended many of the same things. Uh, the education system has sometimes struggled to integrate supports from outside social service agencies, but the report basically said, if we want better educational outcomes for our youth, we need to see to what's happening in their lives after 3 p.m. Uh, and provide those wraparound supports that young people need. At the same time, we've also just had a new Children, Youth and Families Act. Uh, so that replaced uh, earlier child welfare legislation that had been extremely restrictive about the mandate of, uh, of, the, of that system uh, and largely eliminated its role in, in preventative programming that is moving now. Uh, we're also expecting a new housing and homelessness plan this year. Uh, and uh, there's a statement of principles that, uh, and I'll get a bit more into this one, uh, because that's something that some people on this webinar participate in the development of, uh, that is a statement of common principles that organizations around the province have developed around work with at-risk and, and homeless youth. Um, so all those things are, are playing together, um, and right now everyone is rowing in the same direction. It's a really unusual time that um, all these different governmental changes are happening, uh, and there's a lot of willingness to work together and there's a generally shared set of outcomes and uh, envisioned by all these different processes. So a lot of our role as a, as a youth serving agency has been to tie together those different government processes. Uh, and the primary mechanism we've had for that is spending well more than a year now in an extremely intensive consultation process. So uh, we started with broad consultations. I was on the road uh, with some of my team uh, for a good portion of 2017, all over the province from, from Nain, which is uh, the northernmost of the Inuit communities, uh, to, to the west coast, to the east, asking folks to identify not just what the problems were in their communities, but where they thought there were some really interesting opportunities for young people and how they thought choices for youth could fit in. Uh, because the key thing for us is that we, we're an urban organization uh, and we don't have the answers for how we can support work in rural communities. And so this has been very much led from the ground level. The next round, a little bit later in the year, we heard a lot from those consultations that um, there was a strong desire to do more integrated service delivery. Uh, so we uh, did a second round of consultations that brought out many of the senior managers, particularly in government at the regional level, to, do, to really knock heads and, and, and see what would have to happen for that to change in our province. We then brought everyone uh, together, many of the, the leaders in, in, um, in our sector and many of our national colleagues, including uh, a few people who are on this uh, webinar, Terry Lee, who you'll hear from, um, and a provincial summit in, in Happy Valley Goose Bay, Labrador, where we worked on the development of a common set of principles for this work going forward. And I think that's going to be an important guiding document for, for us going, uh, going on now. Just to give you a sense of the scope of this, uh, and this was just the first round of consultations, uh, somewhere around 255 youth, uh, 380 people at forums. Uh, it was a quite large, uh, in, through 26 communities, it was quite a large effort, and, and this was only half of it. By now, we've, we've certainly engaged well over five or 600 youth and similar numbers of service providers. Um, so it's been, uh, it's been a lot of pizza in a lot of rooms for me, um, which, has been, uh, which is always fun. Uh, the results of this, we ended up with detailed regional profiles, both sort of subjective feedback and statistical profiles of youth need. Um, we identified the common themes that, that we heard from across regions in Newfoundland. We identified the key principles that should be behind this, this kind of work. Um, and uh, folks can check out uh, the report. It's a lengthy, but I, I think well worth reading report that summarizes all this work. It's over at the web address on your screen there. Um, I'll just show you, uh, I'm not going to go through any of these in detail. You should probably be uh, recognizing many of these common themes. Uh, there's some really interesting ones, though. I, a couple I do want to uh, point out. One that uh, came out loud and clear was connection to the land and to place. So one of the things that was interesting in Newfoundland 
talking to rural youth in particular, uh, is that they said much the same thing. Rural um, uh, settler youth uh, said much the same thing as rural indigenous youth did about how much access to land mattered. And, and the conversation around land-based programming in our province has largely been around indigenous issues, but we think there's a, a real place for uh, non-indigenous organizations serving rural populations to learn from the programs that indigenous groups are already doing. I just wanted to flag that one. I think it was really interesting. A uh, few other common themes that came up, uh, the real need for more supported employment opportunities. That shouldn't be news for many of us uh, working in rural and remote homelessness uh, and the many opportunities for integrated services. Uh, I do want to take a second also to go through this statement of principles we came up with. And I think the why is important that we need to recognize, particularly from my perspective as someone from an urban organization, that there are regional differences and local factors that really matter in service delivery. Uh, that, that the service model is not going to look the same from, from Nain to Goose Bay to Stephenville in, in my province or, or across any of yours. Um, but the young people do have a right to expect consistency in our approach. So even if the, the details of the programming look really different, um, the values need to be the same. And that's where this statement of principles came from. It also came from a desire to be able to strengthen our collective approach. So Choices is trying to draw together the organizations who are working in this space uh, and exert uh, some, some influence on this systems change that we're, we're a part of right now. And, and a collective engagement on those pieces is really important. I'm not gonna read all the principles out loud, but I'm gonna run through them here on your screens uh, because I think they're really worth, uh, worth thinking about. So these principles were worked out in jot note draft form and then we, in advance of our summit in Happy Valley Goose Bay, whoops. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna go back for a sec, there we go, uh, in advance of our summit, but then the, the summit ripped them apart, redrafted them, added a few. Um, but I think at the core, what we're trying to do here is flag not only the values, but some of the conversations that we think are, are most important to keep continuing. So uh, in particular, for example, harm reduction here. Um, so this is a, obviously a very sensitive topic Lots of organizations are, are feeling like they want to commit to it, but need to do more work on it. Having this adopted as a common principle across our sector is helping nudge this systems change to embrace harm reduction as a philosophy. There's a few, last few here, uh, and most of these were added, uh, many of these were added at the summit. I think in particularly, I love the last one, that this has to be about celebrating the successes and strengths uh, uh, not only of youth, but of the people who serve youth. So uh, I've been so privileged to do work with rural communities that with almost no resources are doing incredibly creative things. And so a big part of this work, I think for urban organizations is bringing those stories back to decision makers and understanding how we can leverage them. Let's see if my computer's gonna freeze on me. Aha. Uh, last couple of points I wanted to make um, on our role is that it's gonna look a little bit different region to region. Um, Choices for Youth has committed that we are willing to play a role coordinating integrated service delivery um, or to provide this kind of backbone support to adapt and expand our programs from St. John's uh, to these contexts. But first and foremost, we are willing to be as flexible as, as we need to be in terms of what that might look like. I think particularly in indigenous communities, that means working from the back it's not appropriate for for us to be taking a full-on leadership role in that space but many communities came to us and said look we have people willing to provide uh, many of these kind of on the ground programs what well, what we need is that backbone support someone to to run the the integrated service site for you someone to bring forward these best practices to help tie all these things together and that is likely a role that that my organization is going to be playing in rural Newfoundland uh, and Labrador going forward. And, and we're really excited about that. I'll close just to say, this is why we, we called our report, We Are Ready. Um, and we saw lots of reasons why we were. Um, you know, I, and I think most of us will share this. If we get out and talk to people in, in rural and remote communities, there's a ton of great examples of innovation and there's a real willingness to tackle the, the tangly questions as, as we call them here. Um, and, and to understand what needs to change. And, and I think, you know, the, the, it's still young, but from my perspective here in Newfoundland, if all this stuff pulls together the way it's looking like, um, we'll really have made a pretty good effort at, at, at squaring a really tough circle in terms of service provision in, in what is uh, 
one of the most rural places in the country. And so we're, we're really excited about that. And, and we're excited to work more closely with organizations doing the same thing outside of, uh, outside of our own province. So uh, thanks for that. They're my contact details. Um, I'm happy to take questions at the end and uh, drop me a line anytime. Thanks uh, to the organizers for uh, inviting me on. Right. Thank you so much, Josh. And I'll invite John to come up uh, to come next. I um, also just want to make mention that the links to many of uh, the presentations are in the chat section of on your right hand side. So if you click on chat, you'll see there's a series of links. They're kind of run together, but you'll be able to click on them there as well. That includes the report that uh, Josh just spoke of. Please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks for thanks for, uh, again for having us. Um, so my name is John Kamech, and I'm the program manager for Homelessness Partnering Strategy with the Alberta Rural Development Network. Um, so um, I was uh, I'm uh, uh, Josh is a bit of a tough act to follow. I think uh, the uh, what they're doing in Newfoundland is fantastic, and um, it's uh, it's really great to see a like a province wide effort on uh on this uh we're a much uh we're currently a much smaller organization than uh than uh, choices for youth but uh i think uh i'm gonna be um i'm gonna be showing some of the some of the work and the, su the successes that we're having in alberta uh, i just want to start off by saying that i'm by no means an expert uh on the issue of youth homelessness in rural and remote communities or in alberta um i work with the experts and uh i provide uh, them with support uh in what they were doing uh, on the front line and uh, so I'm going to be showcasing uh, some of the work that they're doing today uh, that I've been helping them uh, out with as well as some of the work that we're doing um, uh, in order to get more information on rural and remote homelessness uh, generally as well as uh, specifically youth homelessness. Okay so just a few words about the uh, just a few words about our organization before I, uh, I get on to the projects. So the Alberta Rural Development Network we're a not-for-profit organization uh, that was founded in 2009 uh, by all 21 Alberta public post-secondary institutions um, and I believe that that's the only time that that's uh, that's happened where an organization was founded by uh, where every single post-secondary institution got together to found an organization and uh, our mandate as an organization is we use the combined experience of Alberta's post-secondary institutions to support rural development in Alberta and help rural communities grow through research and learning. And so in the, uh, we're, right now we're striving to be Alberta's premier rural development organization. Um, we're a little different than, uh, than Choices um, in that uh, we don't do um, direct um, on the ground frontline work. Uh, we see ourselves more as a provincial connector and facilitator um and um and working with agencies that are doing the frontline work um so recently more recently uh, in our history we've been focused on rural homelessness uh rural affordable housing as well as uh, some other programs such as mental health um since 2013 uh we've managed the uh the homelessness partnering strategy rural and remote stream for alberta um and that's my full-time position and um and then as well in 2015 we put on an expression of interest for, to rural communities um, looking to see if anyone was interested uh, or what rural communities were interested in building affordable housing and we expected that we were going to get about five to ten expressions of interest back and we got 35 so that showed that uh, there was a huge interest in building aff rural affordable housing and so that um, that led to the creation of our uh, sustainable housing initiative which works on building rural sustainable affordable housing um, in terms of other things that we've done in, uh, for creating provincial rural connections uh, we created the, the uh, a subcommittee uh, called the Alberta Rural Coalition on Housing and Homelessness, or Arch Squared, um, and that currently um, that's uh, was uh, the purpose of that was to um, to create a unified voice for communities working together um, on uh, rural homeless and homelessness and housing issues in Alberta. Um, and so we currently have 20 members for that, uh, including ourselves. And um, just this year, uh, we started a rural opioid education outreach program uh, that's provincially funded. Um, as far as HPS goes and the programs I'm going to focus on today, we have we currently have 12 active projects, um, and two of which are specifically youth focused, uh, which I'm going to uh, be uh, be detailing here. And both involve uh, creating regional partnerships and networks in their own ways. Um, and if they're on this call, I certainly hope I do their projects justice. Uh, Right. 
So the first program I'm going to talk about is the Cochrane Safe Coach program. So this program was uh, uh, started with us as an HPS funded program in 2016. And so Cochrane is a community about 18 kilometers west of Calgary uh, with a population of about of t approximately 26,500. And it's the second largest town in Alberta and one of the fastest growing communities in Canada. And so the project is ran by the town of Cochrane and what they're doing, um, it's called the Safe Coach Program, but they use a model called Host Homes. And so the mandate of the program is to prevent and reduce youth homelessness in Cochrane uh, by supporting youth and family to strengthen relationships and connections um, in additional, uh, to additional natural and professional supports while also addressing individual and family issues that contribute to youth homelessness. So we currently fund a youth support worker uh, who works full time on this project. And um, the targets for this project uh, are youth ages 13 to 17 who are couch surfing or otherwise at risk of homelessness and uh, youth who are uh, 18 to 24 uh, transitioning to adulthood as well as parents and guardians um, who are struggling with their relationships with uh, youth and young adults um, and need help um, building um, uh, stronger family ties. And so um, the program um, has uh, built a number of partnerships, um, the like primary partnerships is, are with the school division, uh, Alberta Health Services, um, uh, their addiction and mental health unit, as well as the Boys and Girls Club of Cochrane. And then uh, in terms of rural and urban connections, um, they've also built regional supports in Calgary, um, particularly for working with youth um, who have complex needs. So what they do for the, um, with the, um, the host homes project is it's really like, a, it's effectively a transitional housing model um, where youth are assessed uh, for risk of temporary and chronic homelessness, um, including length of time, uh, time couch surfing, um, the reasons that they're at risk of homelessness, um, and the safety concerns. And then parents and guardians are worked with for consent uh, and assessment um, with permission from youth. Um, and they also work with child, uh, child and family services um, when protection issues are identified. But the host home model itself um, works on the basis of um, adults who are in the community who've been screened, uh, who um, effectively provide a uh, transitional um, shelter uh, for youth who are working with the Safe Coach program. So youth are placed um, uh, with a host family uh, for several days, several weeks, depending on the need and engagement um, that they have with the program. And uh, the project is, or, and this, the placement is te intentionally temporary and transitional. So um, the goal of the project is, or the goal of um, working with the youth is reunification with family um, whenever possible. And for adult youth, um, it's transitioning to functional adulthood. So um, there's a lot of benefits to this model. Uh, I'm gonna go through both benefits and the challenges that they've had since they started um, and what they've learned. And so they, um, um, the benefits to the model are that uh, um, they, uh, it provides safe shelter for youth um, a lot of rural communities don't have emergency shelter or, trans or um, transitional housing necessarily available. Um, it also provides time and space for them to slow things down with their, uh, their uh, uh, for youth who are in conflict with their parents or their family. Um, and also the gives a youth an opportunity to test um, being out of the home um, in a safer context. So the challenges that they've had with the host home model um, and things that they've learned, um, they have found that uh, recruitment for the host homes is particularly challenging. And as uh, because funding is limited, it's effectively a community volunteer position. Um, we do fund um, we do fund costs for the housing, but um, uh, asking people to shelter a youth who may have complex uh, mental health and behavior challenges can be um, difficult. And maintaining host home providers. Um, um, has been a challenge um, as uh, several have burnt as some have burnt out. So um, prevent. So they have a staff member who is responsible for all aspects of the program, who works with host homes as well as with families in managing conflicts um, between um, between both families, the youth and the host homes. Um, and but maintaining positive relationships between everyone involved has been a challenge. So a few of the things they've learned. Uh, from this is that um, assessing couch surfing, um, they really need to assess couch surfing situations for safety and suitability to reduce the need for host homes, um, as well as uh, reducing um, placement length in the host homes from up to three months 
uh, agreements to contracts that extend uh, for much shorter times um, for uh, sometimes days or up to one week at a time uh, and with clear expectations for extensions. Um, so just recently in June 2018, they started an emergency apartment unit um, that was designed to meet a range of emergency and transitional shelter needs in the community and um, youth access uh, to that is dependent on the ability to live independently and responsibly and one youth uh, has been placed to date uh, as it's just a brand new program that started this summer um, but they've also been exploring uh, alternate options um, to transitional um, and supportive housing needs including the possibility of a rental home with a supportive roommate model um, for more mature youth um, but they need to require funding for operational costs um, so their current, so what they mentioned to me um, in coming into this webinar was that their hope is to uh, partner with other initiatives regionally um, to provide shelter and housing um, to vulnerable populations to better address the range of different shelter and support needs for youth. Um, and so the uh, the next program I'm going to talk about is the Cameras Open Door Association. So this is a new project for us. Uh, it just started in April of this year, and so Cameras Open Door is a nonprofit. Uh, organization in Camrose, Alberta that works specifically um, um, that offers support services and youth and hope to youth uh, in need uh, who are between the ages of 11 and 24. And so uh, Camrose is about 95 kilometers southeast of Edmonton uh, and it's around 18,750 people. So it's a bigger town. Um, but what they've done is uh, in, they've created a regional, uh, what they call the integrated youth hub. So that started uh, just a, ex almost exactly a year ago and the way that they envision this is that um, they see it as a one-stop shop for youth services in the region and this was created through a partnership um, with Camrose um, primary care network uh, so for anyone who isn't in Alberta the primary care networks um, are regional teams um, that uh, uh, that provide primary care delivery um, that work collaboratively through Alberta so the integrated hub um, it provides uh, an integration of health and social services under one roof um, in a youth-friendly environment. And they have a community of practice that they've developed uh, with all their partners uh, who work with and respond to the needs of youth. And so um, the, shared vision, uh, the, the shared vision allows collaboration uh, and fosters collaboration and brings together support services to work together to empower youth and their families. And they also work together on information sharing practices, uh, which have been determined beforehand to prevent any information sharing, sharing issues. And um, they they feature wraparound services um, uh, with individuals and their families. And so um, they provide uh, health counseling, uh, addiction and mental health um, um, support, uh, social supports, as well as outreach into the communities. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, on the next slide, uh, as well as emergency shelter and traditional suites. Um, and uh, youth and family support and navigating uh, within the family. And they've done this through an integration of regional, provincial, and community partners. Um, and the um, and where we come in is that uh, we provided them with a, a vehicle for regional transportation. So this was funded through HPS uh, in 2018. And um, um, this was really uh, almost like a perfect project for us because they came to us and said that they they really needed a uh, they had everything in place and all they needed was a vehicle um, in order to transport youth around and so we thought that was we thought that was an excellent project and um, it's also sustainable as they've uh, as uh, after the project's done um, they've they'll have other funds in place to cover maintenance and insurance of the car so the vehicle provides transportation uh, to uh, um, and from uh, rural youth uh, coming into, into and out of uh, Camrose and the surrounding area. And previously, the lack of transportation meant missed appointments and support services. And um, so uh, now they are able to, pro to provide transportation regionally um, for youth to housing, to mental health appointments. Um, and even if, they, even if the youth um, needs to come back into the community for something, they can go and pick them up. And so uh, I was just talking to the executive director today or the sorry, the other day, and she was just saying how um, how how much of a game changer the vehicle has been in terms of creating that regional uh, network. And so as I see I'm running short on time here, I'm just going to um, head to our next uh, bit. So Camrose is one of the communities uh, that's involved in what I'm talking about. Finally, here um, the, um, the there's a. 
Um, right now they're involved in a, a province-wide rural homelessness estimation that we're working on. And so the, um, the limit, there's uh, extremely limited data on rural homelessness, and this is something that we've been working on for the, for the last uh, little while. Um, we kept hearing from communities that they, um, they knew that there, they, they knew anecdotally that there was a huge homelessness issue and in their community and but they weren't they really had no way of um of showing the, and finding the data on it so in the fall of 2016 we started um we started talking about what we could do on this and so we thought that uh, we could produce a guide of best practices on how to best do uh rural homelessness estimation counts and so um we got a we uh got a grant from hps uh, innovative solutions to homelessness um, a micro grant and so uh, when our research and strategy manager was looking at this, he was only able to find um, three published counts across North America um, of rural homelessness. And we've since found that there have been more, but uh, that speaks to the difficulty of finding any hard data on this. And since youth homelessness is an even more um, specific area, there's even less data available on that. And so um, the guide was written and published in 2017. Um, the uh, the method involves conducting surveys in service agencies rather than the standard point in time count method of volunteers going out um, through the community and surveying people. And this addresses some of the issues that uh, doing point in time counts in rural communities um, have um, due to more people being um, um, considered hidden homeless or provisionally accommodated based on the COH, uh, the national definition of homelessness. As well, the survey also helps assess um, what services people are using and what services they're looking for in the community. So that's an added bonus um, for rural service providers. And uh, the guide uses a unique identifier created for um, specifically for it that both protects privacy and prevents double counting between agencies. Um, and this is intended to be a living document um, that we're going to be updating every few years as it keeps being used and we increase our knowledge. So for anyone who wants, uh, whoever whoever's listening, who's interested in this, it's free to download uh, on our website at ARDN.ca in both English and French. Um, the guide itself was piloted for the first time in uh, by the Rocky or uh, the Mountain Rose Women's Shelter Association in Rocky Mountain House, um, about an hour and a half southwest of Edmonton, um, and that happened in September 2017. And what was unique about what they did was they did a standard point in time count alongside. Our, uh, our estimation guide methodology um, and the point in time count ran two days where they had volunteers going out and the estimation period uh, where they were conducting surveys in the service agencies in the county was open for two weeks. Um, so for the standard point in time count, they put in over uh, 700 volunteer hours um, and they ended up getting snowed out as is uh, possible in Alberta in September. And uh, they only got 11 surveys conducted with volunteers walking around the county, and uh, they only found two people who were uh, homeless or had unstable housing. Uh, with the estimation guide, um, they got 57 surveys done in service agencies and 44 people identified as having an unstable housing situation for a total of 46 people. And so um, there's a, a lot of, that we learned from that uh, the initial pilot and that only five agencies participated uh, in the pilot out of 10 in the county and only two um, uh, two of those two agencies got surveys in and the vast majority of the clients came from a single agency. So this was still a significant underestimation that we we think um, and this is only for one county um, in the province and I believe there's around 60 or 70 counties. Um, so it showed us that the both the, the guides methodology could work and that the um, the uh, prevalence of homelessness in rural areas uh, might be a lot bigger than um, than uh, is thought currently. Um, so after that, we started talking about doing a more uh, widespread project, and that's turned into the Alberta Rural Homeless Estimation Project. So we're working on that in conjunction with the Family and Community Support Services Association of Alberta, and they received HPS funding through us um, to conduct surveys using the guides methodology in at least 10 communities around the province um, late last year. And so when we put out the expression of interest for this, uh, we also received huge interest. Um, uh, we were initially only going to be doing it in 10 communities and um, we've eventually funded 14 and we've had an additional six communities that uh, came on board that were self-funding. So they didn't requ require funding, but they still wanted to work with us and use our survey and be part of the overall provincial count. And uh, we also have one uh, First Nation, the Kainai First Nation, which is in south, southern Alberta. Um, they're being funded to do uh, an estimation um, 
um, on the nation um, through a partnership with the Calgary Homeless Foundation and us. Uh, so that's a fairly unique partnership between a First Nation, um, an urban homelessness agency, and uh, a rural service per or a rural um, nonprofit that works on homelessness. So the survey has been converted into an online survey platform with some communities still using um, the old school paper method. Um, we have seven communities that are currently active and are getting surveys in right now um, with another um, group of, I believe, 10 that are starting next week and the final, um, the final group starting in November. So by the end of November, we'll have, um, we'll have data on homelessness from uh, 21 communities and regions in the province of Alberta and bringing this back to youth homelessness. Um, we will have a lot more uh, information on um, the scope of rural youth homelessness in the province, um, as well as, uh, and I particularly wanted to focus on LGBTQ plus youth in rural communities. So we know that the, um, there's been an increased focus in the last few years on, um, on um, providing increased services for LGBT plus youth um, who are homeless in the cities, but currently there's no data available in rural areas um, for how many um, LGBT youth are affected. Um, and uh, this is in and in often in rural areas, there's even fewer supports um, and even more stigma and negative attitudes against LGBTQ people. So when we were revamping the survey for this project, uh, we spent a lot of time working on the gender and sexual orientation questions to ensure that we're capturing this data. And so we will have uh, more data um, will be known on this by the end of the year. And so to close off, I just wanted to say a few words about our upcoming conference. And so if you have not heard of it, we're currently planning, in the midst of planning a national conference on rural and remote housing and homelessness um, called the Canadian Rural and Remote Housing and Homelessness Symposium. Um, that's happening in Canmore uh, in October, um, October 24th to 26th. Um, and we think, as far as we know, it's the first national conference to be dedicated specifically to rural and remote housing and homelessness. Um, and we have a rural, a specific content stream focused on rural and remote youth homelessness. And that's actually due mostly to the people on this webinar. Um, Choices for Youth has a session. Um, I know Terry Lee Kelford is part of two sessions and um, Away Home Canada is also presenting two sessions. And uh, the, uh, the integrated youth hub, um, Jessica Hutton, who's the executive director of the Cameras Open Door Association, she will also have a session on the integrated youth hub if you want to hear more about that. Um, so we have others, uh, a, a number of other streams and topics focusing um, on um, as many different areas that are connected to, to uh, rural homelessness, as well as we have a rural, uh, we have a stream on rural affordable housing and energy efficiency, and we'll also have, um, have um, sessions on things like connected issues like rural transportation and food security and rural data collection research and policy. So the registration deadline for that is, uh, uh, it's October 10th. We actually just extended it to October 17th. But um, if you want more details and the full list of our keynotes and the session schedule for the, the symposium, uh, that's at uh, crrhh.ca. And um, I think that's about it for me. I think I'm probably over time, but uh, there's our contact information and uh, both Cochrane and uh, um, and there's the contact information for Cochrane and Camrose if you're interested in hearing more about those projects and my contact information um, for any for questions about the symposium or anything else I talked about. So thank you. And I look forward to questions. That's fantastic, John. Thanks so much. There's so much there and, and you can see the real strength in the in the um, the work of partnerships with data research, a research institution. Uh, and the homelessness sector in Alberta and, and how that's uh, playing out for young people or youth homelessness as well. So we'll, uh, there's a lot, a lot to explore as we go forward over the next few months. Um, just going to let Terry Lee uh, Kelford talk a little bit more about, about what we can do in Ontario or uh, you know, other provinces and territories out there, please consider as well. I'll let you take it away, Terry Lee. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to see that we could pull this together. So I'm Terry Lee Kelfort. I'm from uh, Cornerstone Landings. I'm the chair of a nonprofit registered charity that's located in Lanark County, so west of Ottawa, east of Kingston. Um, just trying to get my slides changed here. Technical difficulties always apply. There we go. 
Um, so thanks, John and Josh, for uh, participating in this webinar. That's great. Um, happy to be speaking at the first uh, Rural National Conference. I'm really excited that uh, you folks are hosting that, John. And Josh, uh, obviously, I was happy to participate in your rural summits that you hosted in Newfoundland and Labrador. So always great to have an excuse to get to uh, St. John's Newfoundland for sure. Um, so part of the reason why uh, we wanted to host this webinar and hope to host more of them is that um, you know, with my history, I've been working on youth homelessness specifically in Lanark County for about 18 years now. And so we've learned a lot throughout that time. And I've traveled across Canada um, visiting programs to see if they were scalable to rural from urban. I've been out to Medicine Hat in Calgary and St. John's in Newfoundland and Halifax. Um, and I've certainly spoke around Ontario as well. And so there's been some consistent themes that I've seen over the years developing. And like um, John was talking about data, certainly one of them. Um, and then also how to scale programs uh, to rural communities like um, Josh was talking about. So um, so I've been talking about uh, establishing an Ontario coalition probably for about two years now. And there may even be somebody signed on here that I've talked to about that over the years. So I was really grateful when I talked to uh, Melanie Redman, who's CEO for Way Home, who uh, agreed to kind of take this on. And I know Mary Jane keeps reminding me it's for a year at this point <laughs> but as a commitment. But um, we really hope that out of this webinar will come a uh, working group focused on um, sharing and uh, collaborating on uh, information and programs and uh, ideas across uh, rural communities. So, um, so that's the point to the webinar and how all of this uh, sort of got pulled together. So um, I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, Cornerstone Lending Program specifically. Um, I would tell you that we started as a prevention-based program. We've adopt, uh, adopted Housing First for Youth. Um, we have had two counts now uh, with the 20 week and then just recently a period prevalence count uh, hosted by the county um, that has shown us to have about a 68 percent reduction in youth homelessness and unfortunately no reductions in adult homelessness um, there is no cornerstone landing for adults in our county unfortunately so uh, we also were one of five communities uh, to work with uh, the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness to pilot a by name list um, for youth and for rural. And we're also right now working on uh, asking our local municipalities to uh, consider inclusionary zoning that would allow us to use tiny homes as a, an emergency host homes type program uh, for emergency housing for youth in Leonard County. So we're partnering with our local college of Gonquin to build our first uh, tiny homes for that project. So, so um, again, um, not to talk a lot about Cornerstone Landing, but more to focus on the reason why we thought it was important to create some sort of rural uh, network across Ontario. Um, and then also even to build upon the work that Newfoundland and Labrador has been doing and Alberta as well to see if it's possible to eventually create a national network as well. So, um, so again, that was the purpose to this webinar. So Mary Jane, feel free to pipe in at any point because I know we also referenced um, Niagara in here and Halton York. Um, Mike Lethby is certainly a, a champion for rural homelessness as well and he's with the RAF program in Niagara. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and there's um, the 360 Kids Night Stop program is like the host homes out in um, Alberta as well. They're piloting that work. Um, there's also a fantastic host homes program that's been in Ontario uh, with Bridging the Gap um, in Halton. And so just to say that there are many, many fantastic and really important, impactful programs locally across rural communities and many that we don't know about. And I think that the key here is that we really want to know more about what's happening, really shine the spotlight on what's working, help promote that and scale it and help uh, communities learn from each other and have that, that deeper network because it's it feels well, it, it, it's uh, pretty evident that folks are doing great work, but not not networked or not coordinated together. So that's kind of our that is our goal for the next uh, the next more than a year. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'd be happy to make that. It'll be ongoing to make sure that we we really support rural and remote uh, uh, communities to do better by their young people. So, right. And 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 just to say too that the Youth Reconnect program in Niagara has is being uh, has had immeasurable like really strong outcomes in uh, shelter diversion and is being. Uh, um, you know, promoted across the country, but also tested in, in Hamilton right now through the Making the Shift program. So there's a lot going on with innovations in Niagara. So didn't want to leave them out because they're really key and uh, have done a lot for us as well. So. All right, so uh, what we want to do then is is, is develop a, a, a provincial network in Ontario uh, that would support a coordinated response across the rural communities and in and in Northern Ontario. And we, we also want to recognize that, that Northern and remote communities are different than rural. So that's very uh, an understanding. And, oops, 
going back again. Um, this would support local systems planning and, uh, and especially the shift from the crisis response to youth homelessness to the prevention as well. Um, develop a community of practice that would share and scale innovative ed evidence models. Um, and then, of course, a rural and remote youth homelessness research agenda. So that would be some of the work of, that would be developed as well. And then, of course, alignment with provincial and federal policy and funding. So those are some of the things that we're, we're, we, we feel are needed in the province, uh, and then we want to work together to help. Yeah, I think it's especially important to note too that with a national housing strategy for the first time that you know it's it's really perfect timing that rural communities come together to have a more collective and elevated voice when it comes to advocating on a national level for rural specific um, solutions and funding. Mm -hmm. So I think the timing is perfect. Absolutely. All right, so suggesting next steps for Ontario. So we're looking at um, establishing an Ontario working group um, supported by Away Home Canada. Thanks again to those lovely folks. Um, mm -hmm. And to develop a network governance and set uh, priorities for year one, including um, establishing communications and knowledge mobilization. So there's a variety of um, supports that Away Home can offer, which again is the advantage to having um, these folks willing to support this, which is great. Um, so such as newsletters, webinars, videos, online workspace. Um, and then we also want to provide support for rural remote uh, youth homelessness service providers in terms of um, content and events at national conferences. Certainly one of the things I've asked people is that um, when I've spoke to other rural communities in Ontario specifically, I've said, why, why don't you come to the national events? And so um, I think the lack of content that's specific to rural um, seems to be a barrier. So we'd like to increase people's access to those events and, uh, and increase the content when it comes to rural. So again, we're really happy that ARDN is offering the first national rural uh, conference, which is great. Um, and research is certainly important. I think that ties into data as well. So we we want evidence-based programs. It's certainly what's worked for us in uh, Lanark County with Cornerstone Landing. Um, and data ties into that as well. So certainly it was easier for us to start getting um, funding grants and to talk to our community about how significant this issue was when we actually had numbers and, and data to back it up. So I think those two tie in together. I would love to see, um, and certainly I think that's why it's on the slide, uh, an annual provincial summit in Ontario specifically, um, very similar to uh, what Josh uh, was able to do in, uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, which was great. Um, it'd be great to be able to share uh, ideas and programs across uh, the province. I certainly have been invited to speak um, in various communities around Ontario, so it'd be great to actually hear what uh, other communities are up to as well. And then connections to national and provincial leaders, um, and that would be both uh, to national organizations like the Canadian Lives and Homeless, Canadian Observatory and Homelessness Away from Canada, um, but also uh, I would say uh, political leaders as well in terms of advocating for, again, rural support, supports and sustainable funding. Over to you, Mary Jane. Okay, thanks. Okay, so just to, to get a little more specific, some of this is a repeat, but, but our support to the working group, which would establish a network. Ooh, come back. <laughs> come back. Where'd it go? Okay, so our support to, would be to a working group for the first year to establish an ongoing provincial network. Um, so um, our, again, our support would be, uh, is we're offering strategic support to the working group, uh, links to partnerships with other provincial and national networks. So we talked about that. So, so today's a good example of what that, that could start to look like. We've reached out to ARDN and to the folks at Choices and the work there. And so we have the infrastructure to be able to bring that to, to, to the folks in, in Ontario at the provincial level and really make, link those partnerships for knowledge sharing um, and, and uh, policy development and data sharing. So for example, the work that ARDN is doing with data and around the, their um, prevalence count um, estimation project, sorry, uh, we could do a lot of work in, in uh, bringing that work to rural Ontario and figuring out a, a process that would work for you folks as well. Oops, go back, <laughs> where is it? Okay, um, again, support for communication, knowledge mobilization, we've talked about that, we're really strong in that, I won't get into it too much. Support to help you uh, mobilize or develop a research agenda uh, through our connection with the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness. So again, the work will be done locally and in Ontario, but we can lend support to help figure out what that might look like and, and bring in some, some experts to do some work on that if you need. Um, support to seek sustainability for a formalized rural and remote youth homelessness network. So we're not a funder at Away Home Canada, but we have a, a broad networks uh, and connections and we can help you develop some sustainability and lend support to that uh, through our, our 
our work across the country and around the world. Um, so we're not leading the process. The leadership always comes from the community and from, in this case, the working group and then the network. But we're here to support, catalyze, shine spotlight on that work. Um, on the national platform, we are also very committed to raising the issue of rural and remote youth homelessness nationally or pan-Canadian. So again, signing the spotlight on the, the solutions that are working uh, across Canada so that we can share them at spaces like the CAH, uh, but in others as well. Connect rural and remote providers to national, provincial, territorial youth homelessness movement. So the broader youth homelessness movement it doesn't really have a focus on rural and remote yet, but that's we'll, we'll change that. And create opportunities like we've done today uh, to connect folks up. What, how, so how can you connect or participate right now? Well, right now in Ontario, Terry Lee and I are in, and uh, Mike left me down in, in Niagara are looking for uh, some folks to start out with the initial steps of a working group to help form a network. So uh, a few individuals needed to work on us for governance, communication. We're looking for folks, uh, you know, with some of these care, uh, qualities and, and uh, expertise. Uh, but just email me and let me know if you're interested uh, or if you know of somebody in your community that would be ideal for this kind of work. Um, please let, let me know and I'll reach out to them. So we're looking for a core group to start the things off um, and get some work done. Uh, right now, you can also join, uh, so for the rest of you, that you can join the community workspace on homelessness. And the link is on in the chat box. Um, Lindsay's put it in there with the others. This is a great online forum on homelessness across Canada. It's kind of the, the one that we're, the big one. There are many different channels. There's one on youth, there's some on rural and remote, but you can ask questions and, and engage in other uh, providers and organizations across the country through the, the community workspace on homelessness. Also, if you have not registered for a newsletter with us, please just go to our website, scroll down to the bottom and register on the Away Home website, and you'll start to receive our, our uh, we, we send out newsletters four to six times a year on community planning and youth homelessness. Uh, we've all already heard about the fantastic conference and symposium coming up in Alberta uh, next month. Please uh, check that out. There's a link there in your, in your chat box. And I just also like to let you know of the, uh, we're having a post conference, post CAEH conference, uh, rural and remote engagement. So this is an engagement on November 7th in the afternoon after the closing ceremonies. It'll be focused on the folks and this on this webinar will be there, but there'll be some others as well. We really welcome, uh, this will be a great in-person moment to start things off uh, and, and start that facilitated engagement and figure out what where, where folks are with their communities and what they want out of this. So you can register if you register for the conference, uh, but you can also, uh, if you are in the area and you, you're not going to the conference, you can come as well. It's a public event. Uh, but the information's on the CAH website and you can see that there. So I think we're done, <laughs> except for the questions. So there's uh, some, um, contact information again for you folks, and I'm going to moderate some questions now. So if you'd like to, I'm gonna go back in and check um, the questions that have already happened, and then we'll start, uh, I'll ask, depending on what the question is, for, for our presenters to respond to some of this. So, I'm going back to, there was one, and so if you, if you have questions now that you'd like to put into the question box, please, please let us know or put them in there. I'm just, Sliding down. Okay, and there is one from Adam, and I noticed before that Wally Check was on the uh, on this. If you're still there, please feel free to write in to Adam from Thunder Bay. Um, he says, having no familiar familiarity with the app tool, I'm curious how the app compares and contrasts with Spadat as an intent triage tool. The organization I work with, Urban Abbey, is creating a youth shelter in Thunder Bay. Um, Adam, yes. So the this, the apps tool is, is complementary to Spadat. It doesn't replace it. It works, uh, but it's very specific for the needs of, of young people. Um, it's, um, it, it, it's a strength-based tool, and it works towards, um, it drives towards the prevention supports. So rather than um, driving towards housing first specifically, it, it, has, um, it has the capacity to uh, support the service provider to find out more about what the young person needs in terms of other things as, as well. So, for example, prevention. So it's able to assess risk for that. 
it has a de it uses a developmental lens so it it's, it identifies the supports that young people need um, more effectively uh, but it's not meant to replace other tools that you're using um, but what I would suggest though is if you uh, contact me and we can set up a, a call and uh, have a chat about that and I also can share the tool with you or with anyone else uh, wants to and we can have a, a bit of an introduction to it and see if it works for your community and for your service provision. The other thing it's it's very effective for is if you're working with a system of care. So it's it's effective for a program, but it also works to bring together a whole community uh, to provide um, a system of care services towards uh, for young people. So that's kind of overall what it is, but I think it the big thing is it 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 very it uh, sorry it complements the SPDAT tool as opposed to um, uh, replacing it. And if Wally's on there, he can type in a, an answer. And if there's anyone else, feel free to type in some, some response to that too. So let's see. So are there any other uh, copy of the slides? Yes. Um, LMIX has, uh, I'm gonna direct this towards Josh uh, if possible, or if anyone else would like to pick this one up. This is a, a really good uh, question. Many homeless are uh, indigenous. There is an obvious reason for that. First Nations do not have enough land and related resources to house their people. That fact suggests the basis on which to minimize native youth becoming homeless. Put more land and resources under First Nations control. Now, my question is, what work is being done or should be done to coordinate such an approach with First Nations community? Josh, because you've done some work uh, uh, there, I'm wondering if you could respond to some to this question. You just have to unmute yourself. Okay, there we go. Sorry, it took me a second to, to, to oh. unmute myself there. We're all doing that. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I can comment a little bit. I mean, I think uh, the first thing to say is that I'm no expert on on indigenous uh, affairs, uh, even in my own province. I think uh, it's it's certainly a, a learning experience for for my organization, for me personally. Um, I will say uh, that's absolutely the. I think that's that's absolutely an important point to make, and and we do see. Uh, for example, that um, the different indigenous governments within within our province have different levels of capacity, and and a lot of that has to do with um, how much autonomous control of their own land that they have. So uh, Nunatsiavut, which is the uh, the autonomous uh, Inuit region uh, in in Newfoundland, Labrador, for example, primarily the north coast of Labrador, um, has a pretty substantial degree of control over over their own affairs and, and over their territory. And that has absolutely made a difference. I think they're, they're leading the way in terms of um, indigenous centric harm reduction programming in a number of places. Um, and, but absolutely, I think um, it's impossible to disconnect the question of uh, control and of land and access to land from, from what, uh, from this broader conversation. I think that's, uh, that's one of the trickier ones to, to bring into the provincial conversation because, uh, you know, A, I, I don't want to be um, sort of taking up that space, uh, but we can absolutely uh, support our Indigenous allies who are, who are making those claims really loudly. So I think, yes, that's absolutely uh, a big part of it. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if either of the other presenters have any thoughts on this to add or... We know. Okay, great. So that's a fantastic answer. Thank you, Josh. I think um, I think this is part of the process in Canada now. Too, we we have truth and reconciliation is a long process, and the allyship is key. And it's something that we just have to we have to engage in at every level. And it's ongoing, and we have to learn from uh, Indigenous communities. They they have the the answers for us. So that's something. But it's it's our our part to make sure that those. There's space opened up at every process for that to happen. So, I actually uh, have something to add quickly. I uh, couldn't I couldn't figure out how to unmute. <laughs> my, my unmute's been a little slow. But uh, as far as for us, um, one of the things we're working on right now, um, aside from the estimation that we're uh, working on with the Kainai First Nation, um, we are also in talks with other First Nations around the province on um, 
doing um, homelessness estimations uh, with them um, as a first step so that they can at least they can um, start to understand um, the scope of the um, the homelessness situation um, on their nation um, for themselves and then we would we would uh, like once once we have that data we can uh, work with them to support them um, in whatever way they choose to move forward. Fantastic, thank you. So you're saying that the estimation project is really like giving you an opening to have those conversations. So that's uh, something that I find is interesting about data. It often opens up, it gives, it provides a, an interesting way to start conversations. So. Great, so Yurong Ching um, is asking us, and this is a great question, and I think, I don't know if there is an answer to this either, so I'll open it up to all three presenters. Uh, fantastic, a fantastic point. I'm wondering if there is any program which has a focus on serving youth with disabilities in rural regions. Such an important question. Does, does anyone have any thoughts on that they'd like to, to throw in there or, or know of anything? I, I actually don't, so I'm going to learn myself. Um, I can speak just briefly from Atlantic County. Not, nor do we have a specific program for it, but we certainly have young people uh, that we support that are on ODSP. Um, we're certainly looking at uh, affordable housing that is accessible and think those things are important, but certainly not an organized uh, a specific program for that. So I'd be curious to hear the other presenters if they have any uh, comments. I can speak for, for my province and uh, there's very little. Um, most of our uh, disability rights organizations are based in the city. Uh, obviously, uh, organizations who have a broader mandate in the housing and homelessness space are, are trying to pay attention to accessibility as, a, as an issue, but I think that's a, uh, actually a big gap. Uh, and even everything from thinking about the, the physical capital um, around homelessness uh, in rural areas, you know, are the buildings that we're envisioning using as rural hubs for this kind of work, will, will they be appropriate structures? Will they be accessible themselves? Uh, there's not, we don't have a lot of capacity in, in Newfoundland for that uh, conversation, but it is getting better. I will say um, the, the disability rights organizations that we do have are, are increasingly focusing on, um, uh, on issues that, in rural communities, which is really nice to see. Great, thank you. Um, if I could add one thing uh, on that, uh, the one I'm, there's, yeah, very similar in Alberta, um, there's not a lot on uh, disabilities and uh, for people with disabilities and accessibility outside of the communities that I'm aware of. Uh, one example that is that is out there is the St. Paul Abilities Network, and that's, um, that's in uh, St. Paul, Alberta, which is in Northeast Alberta, um, and they, um, um, I know, and they work on um, doing um, housing for people with disabilities. And so we actually have a session. Um, we actually have a session at the symposium on uh, doing um, on uh, uh, building rural housing um, for people with complex needs and disabilities. Um, and we have uh, one speaker from Alberta Health Services, um, a speaker from um, from St. Paul Abilities Network, and and their um, uh, their division called Citadel Homes, which works on um, housing for people with disabilities, and uh, also a one um, an ARDN staff member who's going to be talking about um, our work on uh, incorporating um, the psychology of aesthetics um, into um, housing development um, in order to uh, to make uh, more aesthetically you know helpful um, housing to support people with uh, emotional and uh, mental health needs. That's fantastic, um, John. So there, there's a really good uh, example of something. Please let's stay in touch around that. I'd love to learn more about that, and and you know maybe we can we can help move some of that information across our networks and our communications tools as well, and bring that to some other communities and other mm -hmm. territories. So that would be something that that uh, like yeah, we should definitely partner uh, around that. Thank you. Sure, sounds great. And uh, would you share the auto? Audio, yes. <laughs> so once more, the this uh, will be. Um, oh, I see what she's saying. She's asking if folks can talk into the into the. Um, actually, this is not a um, speaking. We call it a town hall, and we have a webinar where folks can call in and, and speak. We're just using chat today. Sorry about that. Um, so if you'd like to just type in your your um, comments, that would be great. We're almost heading to the end, though, and I'm not seeing any other questions. Let me just down to chat and see if I've missed anything. 
Uh, no. Are there any other questions then for folks that they'd like to put in? I really want to thank our um, our, our presenters today and look forward to, to working with you again over the next year, especially uh, to move some of this forward. And if you're at all interested in working on or being more connected in Ontario specifically, please contact me. But if you are in another province or a territory and want to have some conversations about how to start some of this in your own community, please give me a call or uh, actually email me and we'll have, we'll set up a call and, and we can, uh, and I can, we can share more. Uh, so that's it, I guess, for today. And I just want to thank everyone one more time and uh, have a wonderful uh, afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. And just as a reminder, the uh, webinar was recorded in its entirety and we will be sending an email out to all of the attendees uh, within the week or within a week with the recording. So that will be available. It will also be available on the Away Home website in case anybody was wondering. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone.